it is indeed a blessing and an honor to be with you today. I was just asking the pastor, Pastor Reginald Barnes, who that sister was that was singing. And I am grateful for the gift of her song. Uh, I was listening to Bishop Thomas as he was talking about the area that he served, and I thought I had a big area. Oh, my Lord. Uh, but I am grateful. Anytime I get an opportunity to share anything about the life and the work of Martin Luther King Jr., it is an honor. Uh, even if it's just for a minute, that's okay now. It's going to be more than a minute. I can promise you that. But anytime I get an opportunity to share about the life and the legacy and the work of this champion for justice. Uh, for all people, uh, I am grateful and honored. And so I simply ask that you pray for me uh, and with me. I want to say a word of thanks to uh, the ministers and the lay people from the uh, Kentucky Conference for showing up today. And, and when the uh, introduction was made, I noticed when she said, Duke, nobody said anything. Uh, but I think there's a little basketball game going on today. Uh, but, and that's all I got to say about that. Uh, but would you pray with me? And now, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our souls uh, so that we, your gathered people, might indeed receive your word with thanksgiving and with praise. And as always, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight, my Lord and my Redeemer. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of peace, the Lord of justice, and the Lord of love, we pray. Amen. Uh, every year during this time, Americans across this nation pay tribute to the memory and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And it is a right and a good thing. And even little children can recite the words from Dr. King's famous speech, I Have a Dream. They can recite an often repeated phrase about the content of our character. But I wonder, is this the extent of our knowledge of Dr. King's legacy? And I wonder as well, what dreams will guide us into the future? But greater still, I wonder where the next dreamers will come from. For in our communities and in our world, there, there is a desperate need for new dreams. Because 53 plus years after Dr. King painted that moving picture of, of children from different ethnic backgrounds playing together, 53 plus years after he painted that moving picture of the beloved community, well. uh, here we are. And we are still struggling with the troubling issues of racism and classism and poverty and, and war and violence and countless other injustices. And my friends, this brings to my mind these famous words. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And Pulsar Prize winner and author of The Color Purple, Alice Walker, uses these words from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities to open her own book appropriately titled, We Are the Ones That We Have Been Waiting For. Inner light in times of darkness, we are the ones that we have been waiting for. It is the best of times. It is the worst of times. And in my spirit, I believe that these words have been spoken before. And perhaps they have been spoken and written and thought an endless number of times throughout human history. For it is the worst of times because sometimes it feels as if the very earth is being pulled out from beneath us. 
Again, war and injustice and violence is everywhere. Our communities groan on the tremendous weight of great political and social and, and economic pressures. These are indeed the times that try the souls of men and women. But these are also the times where great leadership and creative vision is born. And somehow, even in the middle of, even in the crucible of upheaval, transformation can be won. These are the times where visionary leaders scream to be born, leaders that refuse to see things as they are, leadership with the courage and the passion to see things as they can and as they should be. And so today, dare we dream. Dare we dream in a climate in which, in the climate in which we live, of a day when the God of justice will, will give us the courage and the hope and the tenacity, even while war rages between nations and races and culture, even amidst the great polarizations that divide us and threaten to consume us where the cry for peace grows louder and louder. God grant us the audacity to work and to live so that the dreamer in us will strive for peace and justice and, and reconciliation in the hearts of all people so that together we can do justice, together we can love kindness, and together we can walk humbly with our God. Dare we dream that the God of peace and the God of justice will, will somehow grant us the courage to live and work and be intentional in our actions so that in our land and around the world where the shackles from our human bodies have been replaced by the chaining of our minds causing us to lose our passion for the love of neighbor and doing justice I pray that God will renew God's people it is my prayer that God will help us understand a phrase that Dr. King used over and over again, that the time is always right to do right. Dare we dream that God will give us a new vision of the beloved community. Dare we dream that God will free and strengthen us so that together we can break the chains of oppression that binds us all. Dare we dream, but y'all don't hear me though. Dare we dream that the God of love will dispel our fears and our anxieties and awaken in us a love that hides within it a power to bind us all together. But sadly, sadly and unfortunately, we the people of God have often not been the voice that rings out truth. We have not always been the voice that cries out for justice. We have not always been the voice that cries out for love and peace. Instead, we have so often by covert acts and overt silence supported the status quo. In my faith tradition as a United Methodist, Every time before we come to the table of the Lord, before we come to Eucharist of the Lord's Supper, there's a point in that liturgy for where we confess. And the confession goes something like this. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. And we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. 
we have not loved our neighbor and this one really gets to me and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. And free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord too often. We have remained silent or hesitated to raise our voices in fear that we might just be called to action. But friends, by virtue of our Judeo-Christian heritage, we have no option. We have no option but to seek to live in peace with one another. We have no option but to seek and do justice and to work for reconciliation. Again, from the baptismal covenant of my faith tradition, before the minister ever baptizes you, before he or she puts water any place on you, you say these words. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? And friends, this is the line that pricks me every time. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil and injustice and oppression in whatever form? they present themselves. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church and, and get this which Christ has opened to people of all ages, not just some folk, but people of all ages and nations and races. I love to look at the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. And all through her life, when a child was born, Miss Jane Pittman would, would take that child in her hands and, and she would look in their eyes and she would say, Are you the one? And so, friends, in the worst of times, May we dare dream that our silence and our uncertainty will one day be replaced with a passion to dream and live into the beloved community. Dare we dream. Dr. King's dream of the beloved community. And dare we do whatever it takes to make it reality. Yes, even if it means that we see each other with different eyes. The other day I was leading a group of our leaders in the Kentucky Annual Conference and, and we were, I was meeting with the uh, Board of Ordained Ministry and our new church development and our, uh, I'll get it in a minute, and our, who was it, Julia, and the cabinet, I can't forget them. I don't tell them I forgot them. One of them sitting here today. And as I shared with them, I shared with them this word that many of you might know. It is the African concept of Ubuntu. And there's a story that shows what this concept looks like when it's lived out. It is the story of an anthropologist who proposed a game to some children in Africa. And he put a basket of fruit down at the base of a tree. And he told the kids that whoever got there first had won the sweet fruit. And when he told them to run, they did an amazing thing. They took each other by the hand and they ran to the tree yeah. Yeah. together. Yeah. 
And when he asked them why they had run like that, when if the fastest one had got there first, they could have had it all for themselves. They said, Umbutu, how can one of us be happy if all the others were sad? And Butu at its best means I am because we are. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would say it like this, that I can't be what I'm supposed to be unless you are what you are supposed to be. He would say it this way, that we're all tied up in an inescapable garment of mutuality and, and interdependence and accountability. To see another human as a person of worth and dignity are the first steps toward the beloved community. All, all I wanted growing up was that someone would truly see me. Now y'all gotta, gotta let me take my time. But you see I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. And so I know what classism and racism and, and poverty looks like. Y'all don't hear me though. I know what classism and poverty and racism looks like and, and all I wanted was for someone to truly see me. Now many of you know that I sort of fancy myself as, as some kind of poet. I don't know how good I am. My, my wife Priscilla said I was good. <laughs> and so I dare to share with you one of them around this theme. It's called, What Do You See? What do you see when you look at me? I'm so much more than the color of this skin. Who or what told you that I could be judged by such? There's so much more beneath this hue of pigment. We're all king. If you dare remove the labels taught you from birth, maybe you see beyond the surface of race. What of ebony skin makes you cringe whenever I'm anywhere near? Tragically sensing hate, not grace. What do you hear when I dare speak my dream? Empty, powerless words, void of meaning, no authority to sustain. Speaking such hopes no matter the eloquence of only pipe dreams buried beneath looks of disdain. How dare they dream where there is no possibility to make that spark of passion take root. Dreams, dead, killed, murdered without a mumbling word. Why even speak what will be trampled underfoot? Don't take it personal, but personality is all I have. Do you wish to take that as well? It simply slips away under your gaze. What do you see when you look at me? I'm nothing unless another sees me real and not in some hate filled haze. When was the last time? You dared to dream the beloved community. God's dream that calls us to feed the hungry and, and clothe the naked and to let the oppressed go free and see every man and every woman and every boy and every girl as the beloved child of God. What will the reality of the dream look like in Kentucky? What will that dream look like in the eyes of countless people who feel they have nothing to live for? In all the passion, in all the fire, in all the capacity to dream has been drained out of their eyes and from their spirit. What will the reality of the dream look like? to that child, our very neighbor, who is forced to live in substandard housing and sometimes no housing at all. What will the dream look like? 
not somewhere else, but right here in Kentucky, right here in this neighborhood, right in the, in the Kentucky Annual Conference, right in the Red Bird Missionary Conference. What will the dream look like? What will the dream look like in communities where children can look out their doors and see drug deals going down? and people dying of gun violence, where they even suffer the risk of not reaching adulthood themselves. What dream is God calling the leaders to dream and work toward? Many of you know that one of my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. stories is centered around the last sermon he ever preached. He gave this example of standing before God Almighty and God asked him a question. He said, Martin Luther King, if you could choose to live in any period of history, what would you choose? And Dr. King goes on and he begins to talk about the marvelous moments in history and, and in each one he says, I, I wouldn't stop there. And he said, but if God would allow me to live in any moment of history, I would pick the second half of the 20th century, and that was the century that he was living in. And he goes on to say, that's a strange statement for who wants to live in a nation when it is sick, when the world is sick, but only when it is dark enough. Can you see the stars? And so Alice Walker says it right when she reminds us, we are the ones that we've been waiting on. It may be true that these are the times that try the souls of men and women. It may be true that it is the best of times and it is the worst of times, but I believe that there is something about the Spirit of God flowing in the human heart that reminds us that we are part of an unshakable kingdom. There is something about the power of God that reminds us in the words of a Dakota Native American, Joseph Marshall, who writes these words, the weakest step toward the top of the hill, toward sunrise, toward hope, is stronger than the force, than the fiercest storm. Therefore, today is the day to claim our capacity to dream God-sized dream. Today is the day to reclaim, to reclaim God's call upon each of our lives, knowing that, that when we answer that call, when we dare to dream, when we dare to become visionary leaders, when we dare to become a part of the beloved kingdom. For well, this kingdom involves not a quality of living, but a quality of life. It is unshakable because it is not static, but possesses creative power. Today is not the day to sit on our hands and wait for somebody else to do it. I'm about through. The day is over now. It's not the time to wait on the criminal justice system to do it for us. The day is over when we can just sit on our hands and say, Lord, let somebody else and pray and hope and say, Lord, please send us the next Martin Luther King Jr. Well, well. But we are the ones that we've been waiting on. Inner light in times of darkness. And we can believe that this is an unshakable kingdom because it is rooted in a prophetic utterance of a prophet that Martin Luther King Jr. loved with all his heart. And you heard it before, the prophet Amos. Let justice roll down like waters. Righteousness like a mighty stream. But they won't roll down, church, until we shower it down. So what are you going to do? It is the best of times. It is the worst of times. But we are a part of an unshakable kingdom. So dare we dream. Amen. Amen.